Hello, we're Steve and Mary Alessi, pastors of Metro Life Church, and we're really delighted that you chose to join us today as part of our online campus. Now at Metro, we are all about the three R's, relationship, relationship, relationship. What does that mean? It means we value relationship with God being first and foremost. Also, relationship with each other. People who walk through the doors of our church, we value those relationships. And then relationship with people outside of our church walls, which is why we believe this online campus is so important. It's allowing us to connect with you. This is us getting to know you, and we're excited to do that. If you haven't had a chance yet, would you subscribe to our YouTube channel? Turn your notifications on so every time we go live or every time we post a video, you have quick access to it. And we hope that this message will be a blessing to you and it will encourage your walk with the Lord. Happy Sunday, Metro Life Church. Thank you for being here today. My name is Chris Alessi. I get to serve as our Doral campus pastor and our pastors, Pastor Steve and Mary, who you saw Pastor Steve in our salvation video earlier. You just met my sister, Gabby. Uh, our parents are out taking care of their mothers, my grandmothers today. So November is a fun time to spend some time with family. And uh, you're stuck with me today, which has kind of been my bit the last couple of times I've been preaching. Oh, you're stuck with me. But I think we're going to have a good time today. Thank you for joining us at Metro Life Church. Make sure you come out next week so you can meet our pastors. They have the best hearts for people and ministry and church, and you definitely want to make sure you meet them. We want to let you know as Veterans Day is approaching that um, our, our community here is actually going to put on an event called Valor Fest 2024. It's a Veterans Day celebration, November the 11th from 4 to 10 o'clock. There's a lot that's going to be going on just to honor our veterans. So if that's something that it moves you and excites you, as today is actually the Marines' birthday. So we celebrate and wish a happy birthday to the Marines. Um, Dadeland Campus, I will be honest, is getting a much better mention of this because Pastor Armando is the one making the reference. And as a Marine, he, he's got a lot to say on the matter. But we just want to always honor and celebrate our, our military and our first responders. So we wanted to make you aware of that. But we're going to be diving right into the word today. I've got a fun one, and it, it is going to be a little interesting how we maneuver through the text today. And I, I believe we're going to leave here with something we actually did not have before we got here. Um, I'm going to be honest, which is kind of like the whole vibe of the whole thing, playing Christmas at church right before we get into it, it's kind of throwing me off. But I think we could deal with it. Let's look at 1 Kings chapter 11. We're going to read eight verses here, and then we're going to hop over to 1 Corinthians. And this is just going to give us some context for our time today. 1 Kings 11, 1. I think when we read the opening words of this, you'll see why Christmas music and our reading is just, it's just it's an interesting fit. But 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. Now, King Solomon loved many foreign women along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women from the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the people of Israel, you shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they with you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. He had 700 wives who were princesses and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. Look at how many times his heart is referenced here. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. So Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and did not wholly follow the Lord as David his father had done. This one's very interesting for the time we're in today. Then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, and for Moloch, the abomination of the Ammonites. A Moloch would have been the god of child sacrifice. It is the god that is directly connected to abortion. It's the god of child sacrifice. Solomon, the wisest man to ever live, eventually gave in to serving Moloch. 
on the mountain of East Jerusalem. In verse eight, and so he did for all his foreign wives. How many wives did they mention? (laughs) A lot. And so he did for all his foreign wives who made offerings and sacrificed to their gods. Now, again, we're going to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We'll read three verses here. This is not about infidelity, but 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 17, Paul says, only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. This is my rule in all of the churches. Was anyone at the time of his call already circumcised? Then let him not to not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. Was anyone at the time of his call uncircumcised? Let him not seek circumcision, for neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but keeping the commands of God. The title of our message today, with the very Christmassy backgrounds, which is fun. The title of our message today is What to Do About Empathy. What to do about empathy. Let's pray and get our time started together. Father, I thank you so much for your church and your word and your spirit. Today we just pray that your spirit would help us know your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. We all know the good signs of like a good day. We all know the bad signs of a bad day. You ever have those moments where if something happens in the morning, you're just like, oh, this is going to be a bad day. Anyone? Or how about this? The signs of a good cook. Does anybody know, like, if you see somebody throw in a certain ingredient, you're like, ooh, we're about to eat so good. This week, my wife made some uh, lasagna, and she made so much that Robbie and Melanie decided to have some of it. And Rob, Robbie's taking a couple of bites, and he's like, is there nutmeg in here? And all of a sudden, everyone's like, oh my God, you could tell he's totally Italian. I'm like, I, I taste cheese. I, his ability to know what was in it just based off, it was like, man, he's a, he's, he's a real Italian. I'm the one that messes around. I asked my brother-in-law before I got up here, like, what, he's a carpenter. Like, what's the sign of a good carpenter? And he's like, the hands. If this guy's like, man, I'm a builder and his hands are really soft. <laughs> probably not. But if you meet somebody with rough, tough hands, you're like, all right. Something breaks, I'm calling that guy. I asked my sister, hey, what's the sign of a great singer? Her answer, for those of you, we should all take this advice. If they don't tell you, they can sing. (laughs) Because for the most part, when someone walks in and is like, yeah, I sing, we kind of go, beauty's in the eye, I guess. I asked Miss Jackie, what does John, Minister John, have to do? Which if you've ever eaten some of his cooking, what does he have to do to let you know you're in for a good night? She goes, when he starts bringing out the spices, you just know we're eating good in the neighborhood. What's the sign of a good cook or the sign of a good singer? You know, it's funny. There was a certain day where We were all wearing masks for COVID. But then there was like a day where it was like half of the population decided this far and no more. Meanwhile, there are still people that will wear masks. And I'm not saying this is good or bad, but we all know that became a sign of who they were voting for. (laughs) We just all knew. If somebody walked in to Target with no mask, you were like, Republican, oh my God. We just knew it. There was, a, there was a little bit of a time, it was touch and go, where if somebody brought an American flag somewhere, people were like, ugh, Trumpers. An American flag, like, we just came from a time where there were signs of, of something, who we were voting for. It, it, it's crazy, and all of these signs have made me wonder, what's the sign of a Christian? How in the world could somebody look at us and go, ooh, there's a follower of Christ? What is the sign of a good Christian? Is it a cross? We've seen many people 
do some odd things with a cross around their neck. I'm like, eh, I don't think that's a sign of much. Is it a Bible verse in their social media handle? What's the sign of a good Christian? Is it going to church? Is it voting for Kamala or voting for Trump? What's the sign of a good Christian? If we had to hone in on one operating system or one act, if we had to, to find one mark, one sign of a Christian, what do you think it would be? I'm going to be honest with you. I think a lot of people believe it to be empathy. And that's what I'd like to address today. What the Christian should do about empathy. Empathy, of course, being that moment where you put yourself in somebody else's shoes. Kind of in, in the Christian's mind, it stems from the golden rule. It stems from when Jesus is approached in the book of Matthew by Pharisees and they're trying to uh, test him. And so they ask him, what's the greatest commandment? And of course he says, well, there are two. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, and your soul, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. So some people would say that the mark of a good Christian are those two commandments. Love God and love people. That's the mark of a Christian. But I'd like to talk to you about that a little bit today so we can all be on the same page about the truth about empathy. You see, our faith ancestors... The Jews of the Old Testament had a mark. Their mark wasn't as fun as bringing out the spices. Their mark was a little more awkward. It was a little more painful. And there's a day where Abraham is, you know, convening and conversating with God. And God gives him a covenant. And it's a beautiful covenant. He's like, I am going to just do great things with you. And as a sign of that, I want you to be able to look at the stars. I want you to be able to look at the, the sand. And this is the sign of my covenant. But Abraham, there's a sign on your end. And that sign is circumcision. And now Abraham had to leave that moment as a man in his 80s and somehow teach somebody else how to circumcise him. And then they went and circumcised all the men in their camps. And I just would love to have been a fly on the wall as the leader of our pack walks in and is like, all right, unzip. I spoke to the Lord. This is what we're supposed to do. You see, the scriptures talk of a great falling away. I think that would have been the great falling away. But it became their mark, the most sensitive area going under the knife. It became a mark that I was on God's team. And as men started to marry women that were Israelites of Abraham's clan and all the way on, they would have to take on that mark. Grown men would have to step into circumcision, they'd have to pursue it. And, and that's, that's very odd. I'm not going to lie to you. It's odd to talk to you about it. I feel odd. But I remember a day in the Bible where uh, one of David's daughters is mistreated. It's, I'm putting it lightly, but was mistreated. The man who mistreated her wanted to marry her. And so her brothers are like, all right, you know what? If you want to marry her, you've got to take on our mark. You've got to, you've got to get circumcised. And not just you, but like your whole family. If you're going to be a part of our family, you've got to take on our mark. So these guys are like, I, I guess he loved that woman a lot. And so all the men get circumcised. And they waited until the third day where they would have been the sorest. And a couple of David's sons go in and kill them all because they had taken on their mark and they were sore. My question again is what's the mark of a Christian? If you were to get saved today while Stephanie prayed that prayer, if you were to give your heart to the Lord today, or if you've already done so, what is the mark that we're supposed to be 
pursuing because there are probably moments because we don't have all of the context or all of the knowledge of what was going on at the time where when we read Paul say something, we, we, we don't really pick up what would have happened. But when Paul would have told the church in Corinth, do not pursue circumcision, there would have been an audible gasp in the room. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, when he's like, hey, don't pursue that anymore. That's not our mark anymore. They would have had an audible gasp. Some of the men would have been like, <sighs> while others would have been like, that's our history. Every man that's come before us has carried that mark. It would have been almost a break for some Paul would have been breaking away from their history and they would have stopped following Paul. But the truth is the church had this problem on its hands. Jesus had resurrected, the world had seen it, and all these non-Jews, these Gentiles started flooding to faith and now they're becoming a Christian and now they have to decide, do they take on our mark? And so Jews were pushing Gentiles, go under the knife, my friend. And yet Paul takes this opportunity to teach them about, actually, hold on, circumcision's not our mark anymore. We have a different mark. Now, again, I'd like to go back to empathy. I believe many of us believe it is empathy. And coming off of our election, I think it's a really good time to talk about it because here in Florida, we just had to vote on something pretty serious. Two things that were pretty serious. Three and four, we needed to vote on marijuana and we needed to vote on abortion. And Florida said no to both. I believe it's a good thing. But many people struggle because these amendments kind of seemed like they were about other people, not necessarily us. Have you noticed the marketing of most of the different biblical value-based amendments or um, stances like Abortion, the way that the marketing where it's rarely ever fight for you and it's more like, hey, fight for women. The day after the election results, people woke up saying America chose hate and they hate women. But it was because the marketing campaigns of many of these voting options, things that we have to vote on, were marketed based on other people. The average person isn't dealing with these things, so they're not going to get you up and out to vote on your own experience with these things. So they have to get you with somebody else's. So we were all trying to watch football last Sunday and couldn't help but see vote no on four, vote yes on four, vote no on three, vote yes on three. And all of them were bringing these sob stories. Left out like it was all right in your face and to a Christian... We have to kind of make a choice. Where does my faith lead me when it comes to voting on these things? What is the mark of a Christian? And if you believe the mark of a Christian is empathy, that it's really not about my life, but their life, because I'm supposed to love my neighbor as I love myself, I think we need to look at what happened to Solomon when he led an empathetic life. Because there was a verse I did not read to you. Three verses down where God responds to the eight verses that we read. Those eight verses, of course, include that Solomon, the wisest man to ever live, who three or four chapters earlier watches one mother come in and say, hey, she killed my baby and then or she, she, she killed her baby and then stole mine. And the other's like, nah, you killed your baby and now you're trying to steal mine. Talk about a hard first day at work. And Solomon's like, I have an idea, cut it in half. Knowing the real mother would step up and go, okay, hold on, I'd rather my kid live, she can have it. Every chapter involving Solomon up to chapter 11 is Solomon's great faith. It's full chapters long of his prayers to God. It's, it's details of the unbelievable temple that he built for God. And then all of a sudden, 
God is responding, and, and, and I'm trying to tell you something here because I, I don't have enough time, but when you look at all of the times God spoke to Solomon, it's massive, it's large, it's beautiful, it's horrifying in the best way. That verse that you and I use, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and seek my face, that was in a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Solomon. Like, Solomon had some of the greatest moments, one-on-one -on -one with God, where God is saying something so beautiful, but something happened to Solomon. And in verse 11 of 1 Kings 11, this is one of the last things that God says to Solomon. Therefore, the Lord said to Solomon, since this has been your practice, and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes that I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and will give it to your servant. Those first couple of words, since this has been your practice, you're done. You see, I don't think necessarily God would have been okay if he would have built, you know, one false temple to a false God. Like, okay, just one, overlook that. I don't think he would have necessarily overlooked two, three, or four. I don't believe that God was saying, man, there was a line that it wasn't sinful, but now it's sinful. I don't think that's what God was saying. I do believe God was saying, there was a day where even in spite of your sin, your heart was still towards me. And then there was a day where your heart was no longer turned towards me. The sin was still on both sides, but it's about where your heart is. And here's where empathy gets us in trouble, y'all. The first major point of our conversation today is if we lead and bleed with empathy, it will turn our heart away from God. It just will. Because then actually what actually starts to happen is we start to feel like we are lawyers grabbing somebody's heart and representing their heart before God. When you and I were always called to represent God's heart to everyone else. If you're looking at the issue of abortion or the issue of gay marriage, and you're starting from a place of that person's experience, you're leading and bleeding with empathy. And as beautiful as it is that a Christian is empathetic, you were never, ever, ever supposed to represent that person to God. You're supposed to represent God to that person. And when we show up starting with somebody's experience, we don't even realize the only God we have to offer them is a God that allowed that experience to happen. We are literally giving them a lesser version of our God. If you love somebody, the best thing you can do for them is to represent God's heart to them. Not by letting them do what they want, but by letting them know what God's heart desires. There is no better life than the life of somebody who can honor God's heart. Because when you honor God's heart, God begins to honor yours. Now you may be still thinking, Chris, but the golden rule, do you know the golden rule? Those words are never found in scripture. We added that in the 1700s. We plucked one verse and elevated amongst all the rest. We said, that's the golden rule. And you might be thinking, well, didn't Jesus do that when he said, these are the two greatest commandments, to love your Lord, your God with all your heart and to love others as you love yourself? We forget there's a third thing he said. Matthew 22, 37, verse 40 says, on these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. What he is saying is you have to fully ingest all the law, all the prophets, and from that place, love God and love your neighbor. But you never forsake the law and the prophets to love your neighbor. Do you know in the issue of abortion, the very first false God ever referenced in scripture, the first false God ever referenced is by God's own mouth. It's not a story of how somebody started to worship this God or that God. It is God coming to his people saying, do not give your children to Moloch. 
And yet Solomon built a high place to Moloch. You see, if we lead and bleed with empathy, we will turn away from God's heart and eventually turn our heart towards other people's. And you may be thinking that that is the mark of a Christian. I'm supposed to love people, but the same Jesus who told us to love our neighbor also said, if you choose family member, friend, mom, dad, kid, or anyone above me, you are not worthy of me. You see, empathy is not supposed to be our practice. We're not supposed to spend every single month like we do November. In the month of November, we tell you, take your offerings and go bless somebody. Go be empathetic. Go look at somebody that is outside of the church that doesn't know the Lord. Pay their groceries, pay their gas. That's not supposed to be our practice year long. It's supposed to be something we do. It's never supposed to be our full practice. I want to ask you, if you met a doctor, you wouldn't say, how's your career? You'd say, how's your practice? If you were to look at a lawyer, you would say, hey, how's your practice? You see, empathy is not supposed to be the Christian's practice. According to Paul, obedience is. What's the mark of a Christian? It's obedience. Paul says, don't pursue circumcision or uncircumcision anymore. He says, keep the law and the commandments of God. If we were to go back to that verse, you would see that Paul says, these circumcisions not our sign anymore. Obedience is. Scripture tells us on many occasions, both in the Old and in the New Testament, that obedience is to be desired over sacrifice. If you gave your heart to the Lord, your next step is to obey God. And that might be found difficult. And that's why I believe that it's called a practice. You're not going to know how to do it perfectly today. But is your practice to obey God? Or is your practice to obey your own heart? You see, there's this almost seemingly unfair story right after Solomon is told that God's going to take the kingdom from you and give it to your servant. God takes 10 of the tribes and gives them to a man named Jeroboam. Jeroboam on his first day starts to dishonor God across the board. If you go read what he did, that man was not a God honoring king whatsoever. And so God sends an unnamed prophet, a man of God, to go confront him. So he does. And he's like, the Lord's going to take this kingdom from you because you couldn't even honor God for a minute. God took these from Solomon because he couldn't honor my heart. And now on your first day, you don't honor God's heart. So he's going to take them from you too. At that moment, Jeroboam stretches his hand out and is like, seize him. But before he can get the words out, his hand shrivels up. He says, pray for me. (laughs) You imagine, kill him. Hey, don't, I need his help. Pray for me, let my hand be restored. And so the man of God, who's not named, prays and his hand is restored. And now he's like, dude, you you can't go anywhere. You got to stay here. (laughs) Spend the night here. And he goes, no. He goes, come on, have a meal with me. He goes, no, God told me not to sleep here in this city, not to eat here in this city, not to drink here in this city. My only responsibility was to show up, represent God's heart and leave. And so he does, takes off, leaves. On his way out, an old prophet, also unnamed. He is referenced as an old prophet. He hears about this and goes, I want that guy here. And so he sends for him. And he's like, Hey, come spend the night at my house. He goes, I can't. God told me I can't stay in the city. He goes, come on, come have a meal. He goes, I can't. The Lord told me I can't stay in this city. And then the Bible says these words exactly. Then the old prophet lied 
And he says, hey, an angel appeared to me. You know the mark of a Christian that might not always be eh, fully accurate? If they have to always comment on, the Lord told me. Because he walks in and goes, no, the Lord told me. And what do you do at that point? It's like somebody got like a go to jail card and then somebody put on a, a get out of jail for free card. And then there was like a reverse Uno card. It's like, how do you win this game? The Lord told me, well, the Lord told me, well, the Lord told me. I've heard it best said that the messenger is perfect. The message is perfect, but the receiver is not. <laughs> Moving on. And so this old prophet lies and goes, come stay with me. And the young unnamed man of God listens. And he goes and he has dinner. And now the prophet who lied, all of a sudden the Holy Spirit comes on him, takes over and speaks through his own mouth. I told you not to stay, not to eat and not to drink. And so tonight, Onlookers will walk by your dead body. The same voice that lied to him now just told him you were supposed to be obedient. That's a hard pill to swallow. But you know what it shows us Christians? It shows that, and this is my second point, when it comes to obedience, we have two options. Total or diso. That's our options. We're either totally obedient to God or we're disobedient to God. This is the mark of our faith. <laughs> I'm either totally obedient or I'm disobedient. And so let me ask you, are you being obedient? Are you, are you walking in obedience towards God or are you walking in your opinion? Are you voting from a place of experience or are you voting from a place of God's heart? Where are you today? Because I, I want to encourage you and let you know that this is not a difficult sermon. This is the easiest sermon to preach ever. And it's the easiest one to receive because now all I have to do is leave and listen. If we choose to disobey God, then guess what? Our life becomes substantially harder because now we have to become the expert for everything we do. You've got to get everything right. You've got to know how to maneuver through every hurdle. But if we choose obedience, all we have to do is follow. If we choose obedience, all we have to do is say, okay. I want you to think about that mark of circumcision and how painful and awkward it got. How weird that must have been for Abraham to walk in and go, all right, guys, here's the deal. This is what God just told me. <laughs> how sore people were for taking on the mark of Jesus, taking on the mark of believers because apparently two or three men were able to come in and kill a whole clan of men because they were that sore, so the mark caused that much pain? That's supposed to be what obedience does to us. It's supposed to be painful. It's supposed to be hard. It's supposed to be obvious. But referencing pastor's message last week, do you remember what Jesus said in his prayer in John chapter 17? He says, Lord, I pray that they would be unified so the world would look, see their unity, and know that I am who you say I am, that I am your son. That is proof that the world's watching us and making a decision about God based off of what they see in us. I don't know if the world is flooding to an empathetic church, but I wonder what the world would do to an obedient one. I wonder what the world would do in this time if they looked at the church and saw an obedient one. 
that doesn't get caught up in their agendas and their schedules and their experiences, but rather says, all of that is pulling me back. I need to look at who God is, what God wants, and let that pull me forward. I know we just voted, but y'all, the world is not more divided today than it was a week ago. We were just holding on to see what happened and to then bring the division back out. (laughs) But what if we were obedient? And at this point, not that it's my practice, but at this point, loved my neighbor as I loved myself and just thought, oh my God, guess what? However I feel about this current election, I felt the opposite about the last one. If you won this time, you lost the last one. If you lost this one, you won the last one. That means that we all have experience in the last four years winning and losing a crucial election. I'm pretty sure we can remember. Ooh, I remember how you felt back then. Let me treat you the way I wished somebody would have treated me. Because my heart is after God. Now I can be empathetic, but I cannot allow empathy to be my practice. Because I I wonder what the world would think of our God if we looked them in the face and said, I love your heart, but your heart is second to God's heart. I love God's heart a lot more than I love yours. I wonder what the world would think of an obedient church. So, I hate to say this, Metro, but maybe there's a time in our faith where all we should do is just go through the motions. You're told to give, so give. You're told to read, so read. You're told to serve, so serve. You're told to love and honor your father and mother. So love, honor your father and your mother. Let's spend some time being an obedient church. Because I believe not one of us cares for anyone's heart more than God does. If we honor his heart, all of the people whose experiences are breaking our own heart, including our own, I believe God will take care of those. But you and I have to be obedient because we have two options, total or disobedience. I pray we'd be totally obedient to God. Amen. Father, I thank you so much for your word and I pray you'd make every word much more. Help us through your spirit to be obedient. Help us and embody us so we can be empathetic when it calls for it but helping us to never ever forsake your heart at the expense of somebody else's heal our own hearts father help us put on our own masks so then we can go into the community this November and be a blessing and to serve and to love because we love your heart in Jesus name I pray amen and amen. Thank you so much, Metro. Before you check out and click off this video, listen, thank you for letting us speak into your life. Hopefully, the message you heard has inspired and encouraged you. Now, if you want to find out more about Metro Life, you can go to our website at metrolifechurch.com. And right there, you'll see more and more about what this ministry offers you. It's great to have you joining us online, but we want you to step into our world if you feel so compelled to do so. And if you would like to make a donation through an offering, you can do so because right on your screen, there's a little tab for giving. Click on that tab. I promise you, you'll be blessed as you do give. So thank you for watching with us. Thank you for joining our online campus family. We hope you have a great week and we hope that if you are in the Miami area that you would come and personally visit us so that we can shake your hand and get to know you. Have a great week.